Right. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the Digital Craft Festival uh, and the Craft Conversation with Laura Thomas. I'm Louise Jones Williams. I'm the director at Clantarnham Grange Art Centre um, in Combran in South Wales. And um, as I said today, we're talking to uh, Laura Thomas, um, who's a weaver, creator, uh, curator, um, educator, um, and uh, many other hats that she wears <laughs> that she'll talk through in the rest of the conversation. Um, so welcome, Laura. Welcome, everybody. Um, so we wanted to start just by talking a bit about your background and your influences and, and how you started weaving. Oh, um, so yeah, um, great to see so many people here today. And there's lots of people that I've crossed paths with in various guises over the years. So that's really exciting. Um, yeah, I've been weaving um, since uh, 1996. That was when I had my very first um, uh, go at it. Um, throughout childhood, I always knew I was going to do something creative when I grew up. That was never in any doubt, but it took a long while for me to just find my niche. Um, it was very much graphic design and typography. I was passionate about in school. So that's what I thought um, was going to be the route for me. Um, when I was doing my foundation course in Carmarthen School of Art, uh, the textiles discipline um, or the textile specialism completely sort of revolutionized my ideas about textiles. I'd always sewn and made things and done, done textiles in school, which I really enjoyed. But it really hadn't quite occurred to me that that could be something I, I specialised in. I don't really know why, but um, uh, yeah, it was um, on that foundation course that my eyes were opened. And um, I had an amazing tutor there in Carmarthen, Julia Griffiths-Jones, who hopefully lots of you will be familiar with. Uh, she was so inspiring. And even though her background is printed textiles, she works a lot with metal. So our textiles lessons involved a spot welder, for example. So that idea that hard materials um, could be involved in textiles was just um, incredible. And yeah, just really opened my eyes to it being something so unexpected. So I opted to do a degree in Birmingham, um, thinking it was going to be mixed media embroidery that I was going to specialise in. Um, but before focusing down, we had to spend four weeks in each of the specialisms. And um, going into the Weave workshop was an absolute light bulb moment for me. Um, I loved the, the impact of seeing a whole room in circles with shelves of yarn from floor to ceiling, and then all of these looms on the tables, which I was completely bewildered as to how to use. But I just knew that this was, this was my thing and I could work really instinctively on the loom. And I just loved the idea of creating something from absolute scratch. So um, yeah, so I've been in business since 2004. After doing my, my degree, I went on to do a master's at the Royal College and then a research fellowship with um, the Anne Sutton Foundation. Uh, so I spent many years gathering knowledge and expertise before setting up my business. And yeah, I work in lots and lots of different ways um, from design consultancy through to public arts, teaching, curation. But it all very much revolves around how can I use that weave expertise? Anne Sutton herself was incredibly inspiring um, for her sort of breadth of career and sort of seeing that um, diversity of practice that she'd enjoyed over the years gave me confidence that yeah I could work in a similarly diverse way. Um, as for inspirations I suppose like all creative people my eyes are constantly open and noticing details around me. Um, I think growing up on the Pembrokeshire coast means that landscape and big open spaces is just sort of in my blood. So I've always loved, you know, looking at horizon lines, whether that's out to sea or looking at where the, the hills sort of join the sky. So those sort of linear qualities, mm -hmm. edges, um, I adore. And um, I suppose it's also inspiration comes from the actual process of weaving and making itself the technicalities of constructing cloth, the beauty of yarn um, and yeah, colour proportions as well, colour gradations and colour um, optical illusions and things like that. So it's quite broad. <laughs> yeah, and that, like as you say, talk about the influence of landscape, you can really see that, you know, in the resin pieces, um, especially perhaps, um, you know, and, and, and how you use colour is really important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, 
and and you did a you curated an exhibition for a Lansdowne Grange Art Centre a little while ago now I can't think how many years about seven or eight years ago called Resonant Colour yes. um, which was looking at um, artists working in many different mediums from mm -hmm. from textiles to, to ceramics and wood um, but all who were very interested in in linear um, you know um, forms and colour especially obviously. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was that was such an exciting exhibition to put together. Um, um, and yes, I, I selected a, a number of artists who work with colour in that incredibly intuitive way, and um, are looking at sort of purity of colour, purity of tone, which just resonates with you. Um, I chose mm. that word very purposefully because it just sort of hits you when you when you see the work in the flesh. So Nicholas Renner, for example, with his ceramic pieces, the colours just vibrates together on um on his works and likewise with sarah morehouse yeah their work they they just um yeah so intensely capturing um but yeah i i love putting together exhibitions to um i see it's an incredibly creative process to just yeah, yeah. bring work together and see how it responds and interacts with each other and yeah just the joy of sharing it with an audience as well yeah, I think it's, I think with your, you know, your curation, it's, it's a real, it seems to be a real joy of, of, of enjoying other people's work and, and seeing those, those narrative threads that, <laughs> threads, um, from, from your own work and how they, um, you know, move through other people's work, even if it's completely different media. Um, that's what, you know, your curation really shows that, doesn't it? Oh, I, yeah, I, I hope so. And I'm glad that you, you can see that as well. It is a, it is a totally joyful experience putting together yeah. shows. And yeah, I just, um, I, I like um, bringing together, yeah, just bringing together diverse creative people, and, you know, and celebrating, celebrating their work. Um, and um, yeah, I said, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the best. That's the best way to put it. Yeah, and and talking about um, you know how you started and your influences and and Julia Griffiths Jones, for instance, and using different materials and being exposed to that, especially at you know quite a formative time when you're doing foundation going into degree. It's you, you know you're finding your individuality at that time, aren't you? Or you're trying to, um, and then to be exposed to those sorts of um, experiences at that stage, you know, is really interesting, isn't it? That, that, that textiles isn't just yeah. one thing um, and, and it can cross boundaries. Mm. Um, and I think that fine art um, craft crossover obviously has, you know, over the last, particularly the last sort of 20 to 30 years has, uh, has really sort of picked up pace, isn't it? And your work definitely does that. It's crossing over into those, crossing those boundaries. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've always worked in a very intuitive way. And, you know, it's only probably with the benefit now of, uh, you know, 20 odd years of working that I'm able to kind of look back and see, yeah. recognise which of these sort of exposures to, ex yeah, to experiences, materials, how they yeah. became so important later on. The seeds were planted very early on, and it might have only been, you know, 10 years later that that, you know, has come to fruition. But um, yeah, there, there was always just this definitely always a desire um, right from the beginning of my degree to try and make work that wasn't like something else I'd seen. I just had this sort of urge to, um, to, to do something unexpected. And there was obviously huge amounts of experimentation taking place over the years to try and figure out what that might be. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that really does drive me. Yeah, I, I, I think... I think the nice thing about your work is that you've got that duality of um, invention and, and pushing boundaries of what can be used in textiles, etc. But also the, the the nod to heritage as well, mm -hmm. and that how influenced you are by you know traditional weaving. And I mean, obviously, you know, the certain techniques are you know bound by the, the technique of, of of you know that's what it is. Um, but obviously, there's so much scope within it. But you, you do make that nod back to heritage, don't you? Oh, definitely. And I'm, I'm very comfortable designing in different ways that duality is a really good word that you kind of picked up on there because, um, you know, I, I've done a lot of blanket designing over the years. Again, I suppose being in Wales, it's sort of um, in the blood somehow. Um, and I, I love designing blankets and I love embracing that sort of traditional technique but bringing a, you know, a fresh colour palette in or playing around with um, scale or proportion to do something mm. a bit um, 
a bit unexpected. So yeah, I'm, I've, I'm very keen to absorb and acknowledge all of that that has gone before me and how that, um, how I draw upon that in um, pushing my practice forwards. Yeah, I, I'm also thinking about a piece that you, you again made for Lantern Grange Arts Centre for an exhibition in 2014 um, called 14, uh, which was to do with the centenary of the, of the start of the First World War. Mm. Um, and that piece, oh my God, it makes me I start to cry now thinking about it. <laughs> it was such, um, if you could tell us about that piece, because that is a real piece that is, you know, a traditional piece of weaving on, on the face of it. But there was so much thought into it and so much, um, you know, technical um, um, thinking, but also real heartfelt story behind it. If you give me two seconds, I'll be able to grab that piece, actually, because I know... Okay. It really Marvellous. Is. <laughs> um, I'm you ready for that. <laughs> it's two hands because I had it photographed um, just a, a week or two ago, actually. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's a a hand woven blanket and it is woven in archive vintage Welsh wool. Um, I was gifted um, a lot of this wool by Anne Sutton when she sort of closed her weaving studio to just focus on uh, painting. She gifted me a lot of the, the yarns that she used in developing Welsh blankets back in the 60s and 70s. So um, yeah, when I had this lovely invitation from um, Lantan and Grange to make some work, in response to the um, yeah, to memories of the, the First World War, there was only one sort of story that I felt I could really explore um, in, in response. And it's um, yeah, to do with my, my grandmother. She, um, for many years, I thought she was an only child, but um, she, she then sort of mentioned that she did actually have a brother, brother and a sister. And her brother, was um yeah he was killed i think about age he was aged 19 um he was killed in the in the first world war and his younger sister i think she was two years younger than him was so traumatized um by his loss uh she was institutionalized and um, that was just kind of what happened at that at that time so she was um you know taken into in, into hospital and um their parents were told that the best way to get over their sort of double grief was to have another child and that was my grandmother um so she grew up in as far as she was concerned as an as an only child her brother and sister were very rarely mentioned she never met her sister which i just find extraordinary but i say different different times different era um it's a real compartmentalizing of grief and experience um so yeah with this um i wanted to use that um that story as a basis for this pattern. Um, her sister Ivy lived to the age of 60 and my grandmother lived to the age of 88. And um, each one of these blocks represents the lifespan of the three siblings. So the red stripe here represents the 19 years that my, um, that my great uncle lived until this um, sort of um, khaki box represents Ivy and they're, they're alongside each other because they were they lived together and then we've got this sort of single um, lighter um, uh, unit here which represents my grandmother who, say, who lived to 88. So um, you know it was really nice to actually really reflect upon that story and to think about how to encapsulate that into a pattern. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I made uh, three pieces of this blanket. Um, and so, yeah, my, my mum has one now and um, yeah, very nice to be able to give that to her. Yeah, amazing, absolutely amazing. It does make me tear up if you're talking about it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people wouldn't, you know, probably wouldn't know that, you know, conceptual ideas like that could be portrayed within weaving. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you do see it within, you know, uh, other textile practices to an extent, and it's happening more and more. But I think within weaving, people would think that's not something that you could portray. So I think that's really amazing. Yeah. It, um, it, I, I suppose it's it, in these instances, it's quite important to be able to tell tell that story alongside um, alongside seeing the work. It's really important that the work has visual impact and resonance in its own right. And I'm an yeah. absolute believer in, you know, things have to work visually because we have those immediate responses to yeah. work. 
um, working on multiple levels. Yeah, but then being able to tell the story alongside it is is really nice. You know, with weaving, it, it is a process of abstraction. It's not, unless you're in, in the realms of tapestry or jacquard weaving, it is not pictorial. So you are thinking in different ways about, about the yarn, the color palette, the proportions, the numbers of threads. I think there's, as I, as I did here, there's nice stories that we can take, um, that we, we can tell through the, the numeric patterning of weaving. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. An amazing piece. Um, so, did you want to tell us a bit more about, as we said, that, that your practice is incredibly broad and made up of, of various elements, um, which I'm sure one takes over from another at different times and will uh, take over your life. And then, you know, I'm sure there's ebbs and flows with that. Okay. Um, so do, do you want to talk about each of, of those elements? Yeah, um, I suppose at the moment, the most sort of core parts are, um, you know, making work for private commissions, um, and exhibitions. Um, so they're all sort of, you know, non-functional, sculptural or wall-based artworks, often encapsulated in um, structures encapsulated in resin or in glass. Also some sort of free-hung textile pieces as well as with this blanket. Um, I also, um, education is a huge part of what I do. I'm a I lecture one day a week at Carmarthen School of Arts, but I also teach extensively outside of college as well. So I've been working with weavers guilds and weavers groups around the UK since my time at the Anne Sutton Foundation. Um, so um, yeah, do a lot of workshops and mentoring and one-to-one yeah, -one teaching as well as group stuff. Um, I've done a lot of work over the years as a freelance design consultant for various interior furnishing companies. So Mellon Trigwint is the company that I probably had the longest relationship with, uh, and they're a woolen mill based on the Pembrokeshire coast. So there's been lots of um, design work and lots of colourway work for them over the years. Curation, as we know, that's a really important um, strand of my practice as well. And then lastly, I suppose, um, public art commissions. So making large scale works for, for public spaces and in, in various guises. So yeah, all very diverse, but it all very much interrelates and informs each other. And I'm very happy to be able to work in such a diverse way. Yeah, and I would imagine, you know, that they, they can influence each other that, as well, that when you're doing perhaps, a you know, a private commission or an installation of some kind, then that can make you, uh, give you ideas for, you know, your own, um, yeah. your own lead work as well. Yeah, absolutely. There's, um, yeah, all of that sort of um, technical, practical and creative experience definitely all in, informs each other and hopefully just makes makes it all just more interesting for the clients as well that I can draw upon such different backgrounds and uh, facets of knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Um, are, there, are there any particular commissions or, or work that, you know, that have particularly been important for you or, or you know, influential in furthering your career or, if, you know, changing how you work, um, the direction of your work or that sort of thing? Yeah. Do you know, it might be a good point now actually to pull up some images actually, because it'd be good to give people some um, uh, some visuals rather than just describing work actually. But yeah. I think what's important to note with every single commission that I've ever done, I've always treated it as an opportunity to take a step forward with my practice. I, I don't do the same thing again and again and again. It's, I'm always um, um, tweaking things and yeah, using it as an opportunity for for something new to happen so um every single one has has been important yeah in that respect. okay i'm gonna need to make you host to do that and i which uh, uh for some reason it's not popping up hold on we'll have a technical difficulty i'm going to change the view of the screen and then hopefully okay. it will let me do that there we go let me do it now um if you want to put it back to the gallery view laura that would be great uh, to, to sorry to speak of you um okay well i'm gonna open up hopefully this slideshow um if i go full screen okay 
So I thought um, just to give a sort of a little bit of context, first of all, this is the sort of work that I think most people know me for in terms of what they might see in a gallery space. So I've been doing these um, sculptural pieces where I'm encapsulating threads in acrylic resin. I've been doing this since 2006. Uh, it all stemmed out of a, a year long artist residency that I did um, in Wales. Um, um, funded and supported by the Public Art Agency for Wales at the time called Quaith Cymru. Um, and so, yeah, I spent a year with a, a, with a resin casting company to just explore processes and to experiment with how I could... I'd had this train of thought where I wanted to create the most delicate textile structure possible, but make it permanent and functional and... Um, Usable, usable in a way <laughs> yeah it wouldn't just sort of disintegrate so that's what led me to this idea of looking at um, encapsulating in resin so i've been doing i've done so i've been working on these since 2006 so there's been a huge number of um variations on this theme um these um these loose thread series are probably the one that's been most consistent over that period of time um it's very much about trying to celebrate the beauty of the of the threads, focusing in on the I say the purity of threads. Um, I've always loved the process of threading up a loom, preparing a warp, and getting it on the loom, and just the very visual of all of those warp threads when they're very kind of loose, and then you tighten them up, ready to weave. I just wanted to try and capture that that moment, the unwoven threads, that potential that it that it offers. So um, yeah, looking at it's a lovely way of exploring colour gradations and colour relationships. So I'd say there's been um, a huge number of variations of these over the years. And um, but yeah, no two, no two are ever the same. Yeah. <laughs> as well as the, the loose threads, sometimes there's actual, you know, actually woven fabric that, that is encapsulated. Um, but I'm always looking at sort of uh, quite open effects so that we can really appreciate the, the, the transparency of the resin yeah. and this photograph here demonstrates quite nicely how the textile is in the center but you get lovely reflections happening on the outer planes and yeah. on the bottom surfaces so as you alter the angle of your gaze there's um you know new things to notice yeah i think that's it's quite fascinating as you turn it isn't yeah. it and it, it seems to change yeah and, and this one, this is one of my favourite photographs, even though it's an older piece of work. I just love that layering of line that you can see on the um, the outer yeah. planes. Um, and that piece is on Anne Sutton's coffee table now. So oh, brilliant. Yeah, works. it's great. You get this sort of bit of optical illusion, don't you? Mm, yeah, yep. Um, this was a piece that I made for um, an exhibition that I curated for Oriel Mervyn um, called A Darker Thread um, a couple of years ago. So this piece here is a slightly different technique where I, I wove um, a cotton and nylon monofilament fabric and then devoured, burnt away some of that cotton content oh, yeah. and leave <laughs> that centrally um, intact circle. Um, but where the, the devore paste is sort of burnt away the cotton, there's lots of movement in the in the monofilament structure as well. So there's a nice uh, yeah, contrast between um, stillness and busyness within that. And do you do you cast the resin yourself, Laura? I mean, how you know, sort of technically, you know, um, obviously that it's it's. I, I the work skill in uh, just the uh, casting of it, isn't it? I work with a, a resin casting company because I work with, um, it's a very industrial process and yes. I, I don't use the sort of craft resins that you can buy in craft shops. It's the, um, it's a really um, high tech sort of um, uh, yeah. resin with incredible optical clarity. Yeah. And that needs to be cast in a clean room situation. It's a bit like an operating theater to make sure that yeah. no bits of no dust, dust or room. anything like that. Yeah, It needs to be cooked basically in an autoclave oven so it needs to be um so it's cooked at high temperature and and high pressure to draw all the air out of the resin so oh. that kind of stuff i, I needed i don't yeah. want to do in my textile studio and i'm not going to invest in those sorts of facilities either so it's yeah. very much a collaborative process and yeah, a lot, brilliant. yeah a lot of my but i think that's interesting as well though isn't it because yeah. i think it, it, 
that 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 collaboration between you know industry and craft is incredibly interesting yeah. interesting as well isn't it that was exactly what was behind the um the residency in the first place for yeah. um, industry to be introduced to an artist or craftsperson and just you know see what happens and evolves out of it because obviously we you know we we see potential in materials and processes differently and um absolutely yes yeah. yeah. That's where it all stems from. So, um, so yeah, I, I spent a year learning how to do all the casting, finishing, processing, and what have you. So, um, but yeah, it's not done in my in my textile studio. Yeah. Um, so, as well as those sort of um, block sort of forms, I've also done these sort of sculptural forms as well. So, this is actually a great example of a commission that forced me to take a step forward. Mm -hmm. um, when we had the ashes coming to Wales for the very first time, I was commissioned by the Welsh Assembly and the Arts Council of Wales to make a vessel um, to be gifted to Cricket Australia to mark the occasion. Okay. And um, when I was sort of exploring these ideas of a vessel, I just knew I wanted to create something yeah, more, more fluid. Um, and the actual inspiration came from um, the shared language between cricket and, and textiles. I can find a link between textiles and most things. <laughs> um, and I sort of honed in on this idea of um, twist and spin, because obviously when the ball is um, bowled, they talk about the spin on the, on the, yeah. on the on the ball um so obviously and, and yarn is spun so i wanted to sort of explore this idea of twists and spins so i've got all these hand woven ribbons um, which are gold on one side black on the other which you can see were um twisted and pulled taut uh, within the form and this was cast as a flat panel and then it was recast into this twisted shape um mm -hmm. and then as it's lit we get these lovely shadows being cast on the lower um, underneath so it's yeah layers of um layers of twists and spins and shadows um mm. and yeah this is the first time i created um this sort of uh, this kind of shape yeah so again as you say a commission an example of a commission um you know pushing your own work forward then exactly mm. And we always, you know, we need we need um, good commissioning um, individuals and organisations who are happy to support that development of practice as well. So, I, you know, I always thank those um, those people for allowing me to to experiment, basically. Yeah. And, and to not be too prescriptive as well, I would imagine, because I would imagine some commissions are quite restrictive. Mm. Um, so it, it's nice to have those commissions that will give you so much freedom as well. Yeah. Yep. So once I'd made that form, I've made several other pieces now since then, looking at these twisted shapes and, you know, looking at them from different angles. I particularly love this picture um, that was taken by uh, Torrell Brancher, um, an incredible photographer I've worked with um, quite a few times on exhibition catalogues. Yeah. Um, and she she's just, brilliant with natural light, isn't she? Using natural light. She's yeah. so clever yeah, yeah. Um, she was finding this piece of work really difficult to photograph so literally just took it home to live with and one day the light came in and mm -hmm. cast these incredible um shadows and she captured it so um and i love the fact it looks quite architectural as well we haven't got much of an idea about scale here so yeah architecture could be your next uh <laughs> i could see that building size well, you know, <laughs> hold that thought. Here's two more recent pieces, again, looking at those sculpted forms. So one of these was for the um, Queen of the Scholarship Trust last year, celebrating their 30th anniversary. Um, and so for this piece, I decided to include pearls um, in the encapsulation as pearls um, symbolise 30 years. So again, they were happy for to support me in experimenting to see if pearls would work in the resin which they which they did and then the piece on the left um i recently exhibited as part of uh, collect online yeah. um but yeah this is what i was so setting this setting the the, the seeds there now i wanted to come on to the um the larger scale commissions um this was really important because it was my first public art commission um where they wanted me to recreate my resin work on a larger scale. So I'd done other projects looking at pure textiles, but um, with this, with this um, project, 
I was um, I secured the commission because they loved my resin work. Um, so this was uh, for the Beanie Museum, an art gallery in Canterbury. They were uh, closed at the time and they wanted um, um, as part of this museum maker project where museums were paired with craftspeople, they wanted me to um, to make a permanent piece of work to mark the juncture between the old building and the new extension that was being built. And um, I, when I applied for the commission, that wasn't that wasn't the brief. It was just to respond to the to the Beanie um, uh, Museum and come up with some ideas. Um, and I was slightly terrified that they kept pointing me towards these windows. And I was like, oh, I, I can't make work that big. I, you know, I don't work in glass, um, but they, that is what they wanted me to do. And I thought, OK, I'm just going to have to take a deep breath here and do it. Um, I Very fortunately, I'd been introduced to um, uh, Rodney Bender, the former head of architectural glass in Swansea, um, a couple of years previously, who set up a company called Innovative Glass Products to work with artists in making public artwork. So I was mm. able to collaborate again with him mm. to explore how to laminate textiles in glass. So I'm no longer encapsulating in resin because that just wouldn't work at this scale. Yeah. Um, so I had to learn about the lamination process. Um, and, um, you know, we, we did it successfully. It was, um, again, a hell of a learning curve. Um, but, um, yeah, with, with Rodney's expertise, I was able to fulfill that. And obviously, as soon as you do a project like that, it leads on to other things. So shortly afterwards, um, I had this commission for um, Cunard Valley Hospital in Aberdeer to make um, a series of nine panels um, uh, to tie in with a colour wayfinding scheme that they'd established for the hospital. Um, and we used a slight, each time we've, we've explored slightly different lamination processes. So we're always sort of refining and um, yeah. developing the best way to actually do this. And then again, another kind of humongous leap forward with this project. Um, so this is in uh, Llanethley Town Centre. Uh, there was a big regeneration program going on, um, sort of, I think it was about 2011 that I secured the commission. Um, and this canopy structure had been designed by the, the urban architects and the public art agency saw a real opportunity here for rather than just being plain glass for an artist to develop um, a, a, a surface treatment to go onto the glass. So the commission was very much about creating a pattern that could be applied to the glass. So that's what I, um, I applied for it, sort of understanding. Um, but in the interview process, again, they loved the resin work. They loved the aesthetic of the threads laminated in glass. And so they really wanted me to accept the commission, but with the idea of lamination. Again, I was slightly terrified because, okay, this is an outdoor commission and you can see that it's, uh, it's, it's a very unshaded area there's going to be strong sunlight on it um, all the time and um, even though we can um, use glass with a uv filter i was not too sure if my dyed threads were just going to stay in the, those colors um, for a long period of time so as part of the research process i looked into the history of Clenethley and looking at its industrial um, heritage. So um, it, it's got a, an incredible history of um, tin plate production, but also co coal passed through, there was steel production, all sorts of things going on. So I decided to look at those sorts of industrial materials. So rather than working with cotton, silks and linens, etc., mm -hmm. I instead worked with carbon fibre thread. So these wow. black these black lines that you can see here, these are threads, but they're made from carbon fiber, which obviously comes from coal. Um, and then I worked with some um, copper mesh and steel woven meshes um, to, um, to encapsulate into the, or to laminate into the glass instead. So uh, again, I worked with, um, worked with Rodney on this project. I was, um, 
I was pregnant when I started it and it was installed just after my son was born. So my son had some early outings to a glass workshop whilst we were frantically trying to make these panels whilst he was napping. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but we did it. <laughs> Oh, I'm working motherhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I say that's another good example of a big um, jump forwards. And um, oh, I think I've yeah, frozen. Oh, it's not letting me go on to the next image. Oh, there we go. There. Um, this again is a, a fantastic um, commission that I worked on um, a couple of years ago, and. Again, I think I would describe this very much as a collaboration. And I know the, the I think I saw the lady who um, commissioned me to do this is in the audience here. Um, the, the owner of this incredible property um, is a weaver and has been, um, had bought a piece of my work from Origin, the Crafts Council show um, some years ago and um, had obviously been sort of following what I've been doing over the years. And um, she had this incredible idea to um, have some of my uh, laminated textile uh, glass pieces inlaid into, um, into her garden. So you can see they're literally outside of these bifold windows um, and uh, it creates just the most incredible visual impact. This, I, I say, I describe as a collaboration because it was, it was her idea to oh use my work and my skills in this way um it's something i i probably would never have imagined but no putting it down on the foot it's amazing it looks like it looks like water almost doesn't it it's like even though the, the colors aren't water but it's it's mm. got this fluidity to it and a and a movement to it almost and i'm sure like in the sun it was different lights it must change and absolutely there, there's a there's a lovely sense of flow with all of those threads we've got a careful gradation of colors mm colours were selected to kind of um, pick up on the the flowers and um, the various flowers in the garden and say with obviously with her being a weaver I think she just loved this idea of being able to you know to look out onto threads yeah it's wonderful yeah and as uh, you said it's it, it, that lovely you know talking about it as a collaboration because of talking to other creative people yes. um you know and 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 your work developing through conversations with other creative people mm, whether yeah. that's in an industrial setting like you said with the resin or the glass or whatever or or other weavers or yeah, yeah. i've got i've got a really exciting commission now coming up over the next uh, couple of months um just just recently secured this job where i'll be working with Anne harrod pierce jones who oh, is a yeah. um, metal smith blacksmith um mm. uh, and we're going to be um working on uh, Swansea Market, looking at their three entrance points and redesigning um, and making uh, new gateways and canopy structures. Oh, fantastic. So, yeah, because yeah. She's, she's worked with a crossover into textiles before, hasn't she as well? So that's yeah. perfect. So yeah, we're, we're really excited about working together for the first time and again, merging a sort of different experiences. So yeah, when you mentioned about that curved architectural form, we yeah. may see some reference to that possibly coming up. We'll see. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Um, I'm just checking how we're doing for time because I realise I'm chatting lots. Okay, here. we've got, uh, yes, it's called Fast One. Okay, I'll, I'll just rattle through a couple of other images as well, just to show people that as well as the hard materials, uh, you know, I do make work that's not encapsulated as well. So um, the, the next few images are, are fairly recent pieces of work over the last couple of years, influenced by um, a residency that I did in India um, in 2018. So I've been exploring and experimenting with some of the yarns that I bought out there. So this is some color hand spun color cotton so this is an organic um, cotton that grows very plentifully in this um, in the Kutch region of India where I visited um, and again I just really wanted to celebrate the beauty of this it's incredible thread so I created these very openly woven uh, textile panels where we, it's just held together by the selvage the edge of the cloth mm. which I, I wove in uh, with this gold thread referencing sort of the edges of saris that we'd often see um, and then yeah in between those two selvages we've just got this incredible sweep of this hand spun yarn right. mm -hmm. 
Um, this too was again using some some um, twine that I bought in a market in um, in India. So looking at a different sort of very open weave structure here. Um, so yeah, you can see it's all about saying look at this incredible yarn and, and yeah. it's sort of um, its own uh, character and qualities. So that one is um, indigo dyed. This here is also using um, that colour cotton. It's exactly the same weave structure as this piece, mm. but different quality yarn um, worked with in a, in a different way. Obviously, the aesthetic is entirely different. Yeah, different. yeah. amazing. Um, so the colour cotton is very tightly spun, so it retracts and pulls back on itself. So when this came off the loom, I didn't quite know it, but it just naturally pulled in on itself. So instead of having these strict, strict sort of um, horizontal lines, it all retract and curls into this incredible. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? That you can, you know, create a piece. And, and I think in ceramics, there's, you know, there's always that feeling of a little bit of alchemy and you never, you can make an educated guess, but you never quite know how things are going to come out. And we don't think of that in weaving. You think, well, how it looks on the loom is how it's going to look. But exactly. as you said, using different threads, you can yeah. have quite unexpected results then sometimes. Yeah, it, you know, it's, it's about the importance of sampling and allowing yourself to explore and experiment and allow and be open to the unpredictable happening. Um, so, yeah, I do a huge amount of sampling and trial and error and what have you. Um, and, it, and, you know, picking up on what I said earlier, it's about being inspired by the process, inspired yeah. by the actual material and the nuts and bolts of putting it together. And someone's just asked in the chat if you hand dye those colour yarns or, or any of your other yarns. Um, oh, that's, that's a really interesting question, actually. I, I had um, some funding from the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Trust, actually, um, to develop my dyeing knowledge and expertise after going on that trip to India because it just sort of ignited a passion there um, and uh, yeah I'm about halfway through that um, process of learning with Kath Lewis of Colourfield, an um, incredible dyer uh, based in Cardiff. Um, uh, Covid has interrupted that, that, that body of work yeah. but, um, but no I am I'm historically I'd only ever worked with um, uh, threads basically from yarn cards. I, had never, I hadn't really done much dyeing when I was in college, etc. Mm. But it's something I want to do much more of yeah. now. So yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, other kind of very open weave structures here. So um, looking at linens, and here we've got some um, some wool and silk. These two pieces are um, using a structure called lino weaving, which the weavers in the audience might be aware of, which allows you to create very open but very stable weave structures, which allow you to then cut into the fabric um, and you know, say, create, mm. still create um, stability, but there's openness there. So this is kind of where I'm at at the moment with a lot of my work exploring these sort of types of open structures that aren't encased in, um, in yeah. resin and glass. and more experimental. Yeah. But then I also make pieces such as this. Um, this was um, a, a large commission for uh, the University of Wales, Trinity St. David's Library. So this is um, about two and a half meters in height. Um, and this is a, um, a triaxle weave structure. So normally with weaving, we have our biaxle um, sets of threads, the vertical warp and the horizontal weft. Um, but with a triaxle structure, we have things going in three directions. Um, so what I actually did here was I wove lots of strips, narrow strips of fabric, which I then rewove together in this. Um, I love this. I, the, yeah, the, the optical illusion of that. I love that. Yeah. I know. It's, the colours, yeah. It's a real favourite of mine. Um, I, the reason I wanted to have this sort of detailed picture alongside it is because it, it allows you to see that I've got this sort of gradation of colour going on that is so yeah. that you see in the resin work, but here it's kind of solidified by being sort of totally woven but this was all worked out as a painting first of all like sort of a collage oh, right. and yeah. I was able to very faithfully recreate what I had done um, as, as a painting into the uh, into the way oh, that's interesting so do you do that often starting with ideas painted out or yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and it's it's very loose 
a sort of just exploration of color looking at how colors sort of bleed and interact with each other um, and they're just lots of sort of small scale studies etc um, but that's where i start and then i would translate them into yarn wraps which i have one just sort of right next to me here so um I would wrap thread around a piece of card to just see how um, I can translate the, the painting into threads. Uh, and then when I'm happy with that, I then take it onto the loom. Yeah, fantastic. Do you do a lot of sketchbook work as, uh, as well, as in, you know, sketching from, you know, you talked about landscape being important. Um, do you use sketchbooks in that way as well? Not, not a huge amount. I actually prefer working outside of a sketchbook because I like to be able to, um, put my studies up on the wall or shuffle them around etc so I'm, I'm, I'm a loose bit of paper kind of <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that's interesting isn't it it's a different way of it's a different way of working it's a different way of thinking isn't it and arra you know arranging your thoughts almost yeah, um, yeah. that some people sort of like that encapsulation of a sketchbook where it's 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 a, a thought is progressed through a through a book perhaps yeah. whereas that's your different way of working is like you said to pin yeah. them up on the wall and um think through it that way yeah and I think often you know with the sketchbook you can only see the two pages that are open at that point mm. and I want to be able to see all the thoughts at the all the time. ideas together yeah so it does mean that I end up just having mountains of piles of paper and bits and bobs around the place but yeah <laughs> we will have our different ways of working yeah yeah that's good. Um, and then I thought I'd just sort of conclude here with a few pieces that I made quite recently for the blanket coverage exhibition, which is at Lantanum Grange at the moment. Um, behind closed doors at the moment, unfortunately. Behind closed doors, but people can see a virtual tour online, yeah. don't they? And yeah, um, yeah hopefully we'll be... The blog is available online for people to see on a virtual tour. So yeah. hopefully that's keeping people going for a little while and then we will be... We will be reopening, fingers crossed, on the 13th of April for a week. Yeah, so yeah, we've, we've had this exhibition in the pipeline for quite a long time, haven't we? And we were very relieved to be actually able to open as planned in November, but unfortunately it was only for a, a couple of weeks, wasn't it, before yeah. full lockdown. But um, there we go. I've just thought I'd conclude on this here so people can have a quick glimpse at, of, of what the exhibition looks like in the gallery. So this is one of the kind of um, the shots the, uh, we don't have a curved floor like that, but this is, shows you the full vista from, from left to right of everything in the in the main gallery space. So, um, so yeah, we've got twelve exhibitors, all exploring um, the uh, contemporary woven uh, blankets, both mill woven and hand woven. Um, and so, yeah. And it's such a shame it's not. We we, we extended it, hoping that we would be able to to be open um, after Christmas at some point, but it's, it's literally just going to be a week, but a week is better than nothing. A week so, is uh, than nothing. so yeah, so please, for those, those that are vaguely local, please do come and visit when we re reopen for those few days. Yeah, I'm that'd be great. Off. I'm gonna come off the sharing now and come yeah, back. Yeah, that'd be great. I know there's a couple of questions in the chat. So, um, where are we? So, do you hands? I've done that one. Um, any advice for a graduating weaver going into the industry post COVID? So we were going to talk about um, COVID and 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 how you've had to change. And obviously, post COVID is is a little bit of an abstract thought in that we don't know what that's going to look like. Um, you know, we, I think we all know we're going to have to live with this for a little while. Um, so that's quite an interesting question because there's how you've adapted your practice and how you've had to adapt you know we talked a bit about how we've had to adapt the exhibition um but then yeah maybe some advice for for, for yeah restrictions yeah, lifted obviously, slightly yeah obviously we all we we're all still a bit unsure about what um what lies ahead of us but in terms of um my response to the, the sort of the covid situation i suppose like everyone it's been a, a major roller coaster of um, panic and anxiety and um, real uncertainty about what was going to be what I was going to do last year. Um, I took the opportunity to um, 
try and sort of enjoy in inverted commas the quiet time and took advantage of a lot of online learning at the beginning of lockdown so i did a lot of seminars um uh, a business coach that i've worked with before was doing weekly kind of meets where people could so sort of talk about their responses the design trust and the design nation did some amazing um uh, online uh, yeah, teaching and seminars what have you so it was all sorts of stuff that i wouldn't have probably have had the time to have done in normal times yeah. so i was able to um sort of absorb that learning and reflect about okay what what am i going to do right now um because at this point last year i had an awful lot in the pipeline which all disappeared um so um the main thing that I kept, that came out of that period of time was thinking about how I could teach online. Now I had to do it in college anyway, but in college I just do tutorials, and that was quite straightforward to just take take online. Um, mm. But yeah, the training that I did with the with the Design Trust gave me the confidence to think about all the teaching I do outside of college and um, how I could take that online. So um, yeah, so since then, with with the support as well of, of the Arts Council of Wales and the COVID response sort of funding. Um, I've been able to develop online teaching materials. I've been doing lots of workshops online and also a lot of mentoring, um, which has been absolutely wonderful. It's um, It was something I would have never have predicted 18 months ago I'd have been doing, but it's um, been quite transformative for my practice, giving me um, stability throughout this year, but I just love the fact that I'm able to yeah, support people through online mentoring in I say in a way that probably wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Um, mm. As for advice for graduating weavers, um, you know, I suppose firstly it's about um, always knowing exactly what it is you want to do and what you want to to offer. Whether you're looking to kind of go into employment or self employment is the is the, the first facet, um, and. I think we've just got to sort of just fully embrace this online world that we're in at the moment and welcome it and know that it opens up other ways of selling, other ways of communicating, other ways of offering services without geographical limits. Yeah, I think it's looking for the opportunities in the situation, isn't it? That's what as an organisation that we've tried to do. Um, and I think that's exactly the same for, for individuals and for artists and things as well, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it, it because things won't snap back to normal. Um, you know, we've all we've all realised that, that we thought perhaps, you know, um, this time last year that there would be an end date to this. Mm -hmm. So I think everyone is having to adapt ways of working and practices, like you said, and, and, and it can have very positive effects in that it can influence your work. Um, yeah. 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 So, um uh yeah it, it's, it's tricky knowing exactly what you know without knowing exactly what his sort of plans are but um you know the world hasn't actually stopped in terms of industry you know textiles are still being made they still need to be designed etc um and then in the, the kind of the craft and the art world that appetite for beautiful things um hasn't subsided um we're just having to show and share that in different ways now um but i think the main bit of advice i always give my graduates is you make your own opportunities don't just sit there waiting for things to present themselves to you it's like what you want to do really proactive in making contacts for yourself yeah Great. And then someone's asked, it's a sort of a, a follow on really, I'm considering a change my career and go back to weaving. Um, and is there a lot of competition? I think the the world of weaving is quite healthy at the moment. There's been a real resurgence of interest in um, in handwoven textiles over the last 10 years. So I think um, the, the, the the audience has developed and grown which is really encouraging yeah. um in terms of lots of competition you know kind of it's a yes and no it depends exactly what it is you're um wanting to make but you know you've just got to be very aware of what else is all out there and then try and find your try and find your niche yeah yeah that's what i was going to say it's finding your 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 usp your unique selling point isn't it for for whatever you do um so it's um and you can work quite traditionally and still have a USP. Um, so I think it's thinking in those terms. I think, you know, what we're saying about uh, 
lockdown and 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 what people are interested in in you know people are spending a lot more time at home so there has been um you know people people have had um not everybody but certain people have had more disposable income because they've not been paying for you know traveling to work etc you know others it's been very difficult but for those that have got that more disposable income some of them are spending it on their houses you know and spending on things for their houses Mm -hmm. so um i think there is a, a an increased appetite for you know handmade items for the house isn't there yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of the mainstream sort of interiors, press, etc., they've all been celebrating uh, craft and craftsmanship in greater in, in, uh, in a greater sense in the last few years. And it's one of the key ways that we can yeah add, add difference yeah. to our homes, make them feel far more special. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think a lot of a lot of people who work in that interiors interiors realm have a lot of done quite well actually this last year because yeah people have been looking around their four walls and thinking how can I improve this yeah yeah what can I do yeah so um I don't know if anybody else has any questions if there's anybody who would like to to come on and ask a question um oh I've got one more in the chat um how do you experience the position of textiles and weaving within the museum and gallery world Oh, um, I suppose I, you know, I'm working with galleries that um, know their audience and have a focus on craft and applied art. So um, I've never, I've never really experienced any sort of closing of doors because I'm, um, you know, working in fiber, but I've also just focused my attention in in working in that way. Um, But I think in in a broader sense, um, I'm, the uh, the Annie Albers exhibition at the Tate Modern a couple of years ago has done absolute wonders for the um, uh, the understanding of weaving as an art form, uh, and there's been knock on ripple effects right across the the fine art gallery world. You, we're seeing far more um, textile pieces in traditionally visual art spaces, so I think I think it's a good time to be. A weaver artist at the moment. Yeah, definitely, I would agree with that. As I said, you know, as I said earlier on in the conversation about that that crossover between fine art and craft, those those walls have been breaking down over the last, you know, thirty years, especially. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, those trailblazers, like you said, mm-hmm. that 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 you know started that. 50 60 70 years ago um so and but it, it definitely is there's there is a movement and an appreciation within um, more traditional visual arts galleries i think isn't there and also at the, the high end sort of craft um realm as well i've been going to collect the the crafts council um ultra high-end craft um uh, events for many many years i showed in the very first one actually at the vna back in i think it was like 2004 i think um and with all of the, every year I would go and visit and I would literally count how many woven works there are in the whole show. And sometimes, you know, there might be one or two or three, it was a very minimal amount. But in the, la- in the last one, that, the last physical one that I went to last year, there was a really large uh, um, presence for, for textiles and for specifically woven textiles. So um, the, clearly if the galleries are showing it, they feel that there's an audience there for it. Um, so yeah. Uh, it's all, all very all very positive at the moment I feel yeah great well with that in mind uh, did you want we'll just uh, spend a minute or two because we're coming up to the end t- to talk about your your future plans and I know you've just moved studios which has been a huge <laughs> endeavor um, but that's you know it, it, exciting opportunities in that mm, yeah so um I've, I think this is my sixth uh, studio space. Um, my, my family definitely don't want to, to move me anymore. And I don't <laughs> think I'm going to either. Um, I'm, I'm in uh, UNE, just outside of Bridgend. Um, so for those that are um, possibly familiar with the area or um, interested in ceramics, you might be familiar with UNE Pottery. So I'm, I'm renting a space from them. They're literally next door to me and they are the oldest established working pottery in Wales. So there's a great heritage to this site. Um, But yeah, I've got um, the biggest studio space I've ever had now. Um, I'm just wondering if I can give a little kind of sweep around with the um, with the laptop now. So I've got this your little virtual tour on Instagram (laughs) on on Instagram as well. Um, 
so uh, yeah, so I've got much more space here. Um, I'm obviously kind of waiting to see how things unfold in these in these COVID times, but I'm really um, hoping to be able to run workshops from here in due course. You know, yeah. when we're back to physically being in the same space as each other, um, and also having the the space open for visitors as well. Uh, and I'm I say I'm mulling over whether to have regular weekly opening hours or to kind of yeah. do open studio events maybe on a monthly basis so I think the best thing to do there is people sign up for my email newsletter via my website and you know follow me on on Instagram etc and see how that and let them know yeah, that yeah. that's how I'll be letting people know yeah but okay. uh, yeah very 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 excited to be here now and uh, there's parking right outside so you've got all the pragmatics and practicality yeah practical things of getting things in and out and it looks amazing yeah and it's lovely to be able to have that display space and like you said possibility of of you know small workshop space or visits or you know that's such a, a nice thing to be able to have in the studio space isn't it yeah well, that's great okay well I think we've sort of we've slightly gone over time but it's been fantastic to talk to you Laura as always um yeah. and um thank you everyone for joining us um in this digital craft festival craft conversation um and please have a look at uh the craft festival website to um see what's going on for the rest of the day okay thanks very much thank you very much thank you thank you everyone <laughs>